So today we're doing insects. Okay, this is the third most popular topic. Actually, there are, there are several that are tied for third, but I like this one. So we're doing this one. Um, yeah, so the size here represents number of species. Okay, number of described species. So there's a lot of insects. You might be lucky to find that, but you might as well to describe it in the S curve. Yeah. Uh, putting them to the S for their job. Um, and various other groups too. Okay, so <coughs> vertebrates, fish here, dog here, mammals here. You know, tiny insignificant things. All right, so if you want to see in animal life, you know, see in insects. So yeah. Are they like the most, like the biggest group of. Well, they're, like, so insects are a very diverse group, but of course, you, you can go one note down. And so crustaceans, including insects, are bigger than that, and so forth. Right? And arthropods. What? Yes, insects are clade. Yep, good question. Yep. Question? Okay. So this just shows the number of species again, right? So if I said, pick the species at random across life and gave it to you, if you said, oh, this is an insect, you'd be right over half the time, okay, even without looking at it. And this just shows the key to them. Okay. <coughs> and some of them are paraphyletic groups, so non arthropod right? So that's not a clade. It's all the arthropods minus insects. Okay, here's an arthropod phylogeny. Okay. <coughs> and so we have arthropods, we have chilicerata and mandibulata. Okay. So those sorts of things like bushy crabs and spiders. Okay. Um, and we have mandibulata, we have mandibles. Is that important trait? Not really, it's just a piece of major clay. But we call it traits too. And then the pink crustacea included pods and then the pods are. And here's a phylogeny of insects themselves. So we can see this. Um, <coughs> the ones you probably most familiar with are here. So fleas, flies, needles, wasps, bees, ants, butterflies, caterpillars, revenues. Um, uh, So insects we have so think taxonomy, we have orders of insects, right? So Lepidoptera is an order. We call it is an order. They found a new order like ten years ago. So they didn't know when they look at these and they found them what's that happening. Yeah. What are the dash lines? Good. The dash line is we don't know a lot more. So for example, Stripsipura. Are these really weird parasites where the females just burrow inside the abdomen of another insect and have you to have no eyes or anything? This is in there, they go nuts out and consuming. And the males of them are these <coughs> strange, looks sort of like flies, but they have these big eyes with big omatidia. So rather than sort of normal like bead eye that has lots of little facets, it has a few big facets. And it's not clear whether they're sister to beetles or sister to flies. Because flies have halt ears, right? These little things that spin around and help give them stability while they fly, right? And so their forewing has is a flight wing, and their hind wings are these halt ears. These Recyptera, the forewing of the halt ears, and the hind wings are flight. So they reversed it. Now in beetles, the hind wings are for flight and the forewings are the elytra, like the red the red wing covers of like ladybugs. Right? So 
by those criteria, it's pretty hard to tell which is which. And then genetically, um, <coughs> Cicifera evolve very quickly. They have very long length of branch lengths. So you think it flies. And so in the way we build trees, there's a bias called long branch attraction, where Here's my tree. Okay. I put A, B, C, D. Okay. By chance, I can have the same traits arise on these two branches. Right. And then parsimony or other methods might incorrectly group. Those two long branches. And so in flies, in the that can happen. Okay. And through the simulation to show that if they're long fast enough, that could be the case. So, um, <coughs> um, ears dashed. Okay. Is it possible that termites are within cockroaches? Okay. So termites are just especially friendly cockroaches. Um, cockroaches themselves are sort of sub subsocial, some interaction. Um, so that's the phylogeny in insects. Okay. And, and the, why does it matter to know the phylogeny of insects? Well, this is the phylogeny of a lot of animal life. Right. So it's worth knowing this, the history. Okay. Um, morphology. Okay, so you all know this, right? Head, thorax, abdomen. Do all insects look this way? Pretty close. Um, one of the weirdest conceptions of ants. So ants, we have some things like head, thorax, abdomen, right? Um, but actually, well, to that insect, these two segments of the thorax are actually derived from abdominal segments. So we took, you know, the abdomen. Okay. And sometimes they have a petiole and a close petiole. Okay. Um, <coughs> how do insects breathe? Mm -hmm. how, do they, how do they get oxygen in? Parts of their abdomen. Yeah. Right. Okay. So they get air in through that way. Um, <coughs> and so basically you could you know cut open inside the spherical is from this branching structure. And at the end, you have water. Okay. And so the air goes in and then is absorbed and flows through the hemolymph. Okay. Why do we care? Right, so, yes, it's good to know everything, no information. Great. Yeah. How so? Right, so metabolic rates affected by um, oxygen level, right? Good. What else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can see, you know, how breathing has evolved. So, you know, um, life has life evolved in the ocean, and then eventually got on land. Right. So the ways it got on land, and so you can see how often adapted to life on land. Right. So insects they have spiracles. We have lungs. Scorpions have book lungs. Um, so there's very ways to use um, 
some uh, terrestrial snails have a different breathing apparatus. So there's different ways where they've evolved the ability to take in oxygen. Okay. Um, does this set any constraints on them? Right? So evolution is all about you know optimizing with evolution with optimizing traits with these with constraints, right? So what constraints does this put on an insect? Yeah. Size. How so? So, for instance, they have to have oxygen go all the way in here and, you know, CO2 go back out. And so as you get bigger, it becomes harder to do. Also, you develop more and more your body cavity to this respiratory system. So, it creates this constraint on getting bigger. So, if you have more oxygen in the atmosphere, then you can get by with less flow so you can be bigger. Right? Um, so, you know, Dragonfly is a three-foot wingspan. Um, <coughs> but now we have lower O2 levels. And so, and that implies the index is lower because of that. Okay. Okay, and here is the dissection of an insect. Okay. Um, eye and antenna, and they have three eyes here. Can you see those? Let's look at the top of these head. They have three eyes on the top of their head. Those are the main eyes. And you can sell it. Um, <coughs> here is thank you for inspiration. Um, I mean, insects are really good system for moving water. Uh, so they are very, very water efficient. Why is this relevant? Adaptation to trust reality. Good. What else? Right. Yep. Exactly. Let's move in arid, arid environments. Good. Okay. <coughs> now, one trend in insects is sort of um, emerging of these sets of nerve cells. Right. So for us. You know, the big bunch of nerve cells up here, and the same stuff down. Right? So all you're thinking happens up here. Right? With insects, <coughs> you don't have some clusters of them here. If I'm sort of through a single, like, giant computer, you have a bunch of single connections. And then you've got some of them emerging too. Okay, so insect life cycles. What's one insect life cycle you know? Butterfly, right. So basically, thing, egg, larva, pupa, adult, right? Do all insects do that sort of thing? Okay, what's an exception? How about ants? Do ants do that? Who says yes? One if yes, two if no. Okay. Actually, they do. So, if you ever see a column of ants moving, this can carry these little white worms sometimes. Right? Those are the larvae. And same will also carry these little brown ovals, they're the pupae. Okay, so ants do the same sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Grasshoppers, do grasshoppers do that? Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. So, 
insects, uh, we call hull metabolist insects, which goes back to the phylogeny, are clade. Okay. Um, They go through this stage where they have a larva, you know, and then a pupa, and an adult, right? Many insects go through incomplete metamorphosis, right? Where they don't have this pupal phase. They go from egg to larva, and So what? Why do you care about this from a macroevolutionary macro perspective? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, big leap in what way? Right. Yeah. You learn something, think about a caterpillar, right? You learn something that has six legs and then a bunch of maybe fake legs, um, four legs in the back, right? Um, rudimentary vision, no flight, and then there's this weird phase, and now comes something that can fly and see well, and eats a completely different food source. Question? Right, so in general, if you have, you know, one larval form that's adapted to just get bigger, so eat, and you have an adult form that's just mate and disperse, right? You can now, since you have the separation, you can optimize each one separately, right? So you can break these evolutionary constraints, okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> think about it. if for mating dispersal, it helps to have really good eyes, so you can see the mates and see the first plants, right? But as a larva is inside a leaf and just eating everything around you as food, right? you need the eyes for that. I can see it's a death of the leaf. So it's a popular for the leaf. And so, <coughs> right trying to have a balance, you know, having, you know, small, cheap eyes when you're young and big, especially when you're, when you're older, mm -hmm. you can have a sort of community. Instead, you can have, you know, small eyes when you're young and then discreetly different eyes when you're an adult. So you're thinking about exceptions. Are you always thinking when you're thinking about evolution, you always start trying to think about exceptions. Alright, so let's what could be wrong about this? So the exception to this idea that um, lack of metamorphosis leads to um, having to be in the same environment. Right, so we've talked about specialization being potentially bad in the long term, right? So now you have two different ways you can specialize. And so if one of those turns out to be bad, you know, bad in the long term, then you're in trouble with the species. Um, <coughs> What's happening in this species? What's Flying predator. 
But here's something then that doesn't go through metamorphosis, but still has very different habitats it lives in. Okay. So we can see then how moving homotopes could help you get different habitats and specialize as adult in larva, but adult in juveniles. Um, but in this case, you, know, you don't need that. On the other hand, you know, the eye size is pretty similar. So having wings can make that change, but other features are similar. Where maybe if they were hall metabolites, they wouldn't have to do that. Okay. Any questions about this? So you just look at this and figure out what I'm trying to talk about here. So what are these all examples of? Colonies, right. Eusocial, right? So insects that have overlapping generations, that have you know similar individuals specialized for reproduction, and so forth. Um, and so eusociality hasn't evolved many times, um, but where it's evolved, it's you know become really important. So ants and termites dominate entire ecosystems, right? Um, they actually have a eusocial mammal. You know what it is? That's at the Knoxville Zoo. Naked mole rats, yes. Right? So you have the equivalent of a queen um, <coughs> who does reproduction and workers take care of her. So just like termites. Okay. <coughs> Why is this sociality interesting in the context of this class? Right, so how's that? So, why is that a question? Why is that? Okay, I'll use the term to talk about it actually. So, why don't we break them into groups and talk about why eusociality is challenging to explain what we've been talking about for evolution? Yeah, so why would that our evolution of eusociality be challenging for us thinking about how we think, how we think things evolve? Uh, no, they're, they're chelicerates, so I, I think they're chelicerates, yeah. So they would probably be like spiders and things like that, where it's, um, you know, that they, they have a juvenile phase, but they don't have, like, a larva. 
this way. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Huh. I don't know. All right, so let's talk. So what's what's the what's the issue here? Yeah. Okay. Why is that hard to think of? All right, so think about it. I said to you, okay, guys, I have a great idea. So you give all your money to my kids and also sacrifice your lives to my kids and don't have any kids yourselves. Okay? That's a great stable strategy for you guys. Trust me. It's wonderful. I know, I know macroevolution. Right? I mean, if you could cheat and you know, have kids on the side, you'd have a lot more fitness than just helping my kids. Right? <coughs> um, wouldn't we'll be as happy though. So, Right, the question is how do you go from a strategy where you know each individual produces their own offspring to a strategy where I'll sacrifice for Bob's offspring? Right. <coughs> Any ideas of how this might happen? And this is an active area of research, so we have we have some good theories about it, but I nailed that completely. Right, so why does that matter here? So, um, it's really interesting because <coughs> um, at worst you're equally related to your sibling and offspring, sometimes you may be more related to your offspring, sibling and offspring, right? And so, if I can have someone out, my, you know, my sister reproduce instead of me, and together we can have, um, you know, three kids or each separately each have one kid, then it's to my advantage to be social. Good. Um, other questions about this? Ah, uh, women now? A male. Good. <laughs> um. So, in Ancestry, in Hymenopter, that's true. Termites is a like male and female dominant, but in Hymenoptera you have a single queen. Right? Or you can create a lot of local queens for a nest. But what happens is a female from a nest will typically fly off and mate with one or more males, and then that's it for life. Just throw their sperm and go dig a nest and then start reproducing. Right? And so there are drones that are produced that are fertile males. And all they do is you go mate die. Right? There's I think, a few cases where we think we were <coughs> someone ants come up to each other and you know do the whole like antennae thing and then sort of exchange stuff. Um, you know they're exchanging fluid. So so on that diagram of insects they have this crop and they can store food in their crop. And so ants can go out, suck some nectar, go to a near a nest mate and share. Like you have to go through a colony. Or you can have your W ant bait to go through a colony. Um, <coughs> and there's a few cases where we see that drones will share with other ants, but generally they're, they're just sucking down and not sharing with them. Right? So it's very, you know, so they don't have much interaction other than just to go mate and die. And the second, yeah. Well, but she only, she, right, and she needs sperm only for females, not for males. But she your question? Yeah. 
Oh, so and all workers? No. So the work so the drones are the males, they're not sterile. The workers in some species they are sterile, in some species they're not sterile. Um, so in some wasps, like the yellow jackets you have in your backyard, right? There might be only one queen who does reproducing, but the others are all fertile. Right? But she she's the only one who reproduces through some sort of dominance hierarchy. Um, in ants like the wood ants you see outside of Formica or other ants like Campanotus, carpenter ants, they're, the workers are sterile. But in some other ants, um, small colonies, all workers can be fertile, okay? but then they don't reproduce. In bee colonies, the female worker bees haven't made it, so they can't produce female offspring, but they can produce males. They can lay unfertilized eggs, and it's haplotypically they grow into males. Um, and there what can happen is, it's the other worker's advantage to not let their sisters reproduce in that way, and hence to have the, all the resources go to other sisters rather than nephews. And so they'll go through and kill these eggs. It's called worker policing. Yeah, so, no, so we see in cases. So you think it's actually the work the queen is a different worker, and same with like the yellow jackets, right? The queen doesn't look any different. Over time, you get specialization. You you, you can get evolutionary specialization, where the queen becomes really well adapted for, you know, you're just laying it. You get part of this to turn my queen, right? This little head and body and this giant egg producing sack, right? <coughs> Army ant comes the same way, um, so, but only eventually in evolution do you get that. The queens and uh, queens and bees are more similar. It's still different. More similar to the one. Of course, we also get other variation too in some you know, like, like leaf cutter ants. You have <coughs> some large ones to guard guard the others. There's some sort of regular ones to just cut leaves. You have small minims, really tiny ones that hang on top of the other ones. And you've got about, about forward flies. These flies will come and an egg in its head, right? And so they were little tiny workers, but rather the other ones and the movements flies. Right? And so it's really cool specialization um, it's evolved over time. Right. So <coughs> what we think determines that is mostly like nutritional status. Right? So for example in bees, so you have a whole bunch of fertilized eggs, so they're all gonna be female. Which one's going to be queens? So the queens are spelled just fed a special food called royal jelly that triggers them to become queens. And then they go off and disperse and form hives of their own. Yeah. Strict equality. Yeah. Except for them nurturing. Yeah. I mean, this, there is, and of course, like all life, it's a little more complex because if you have a queen who's mated multiple times, then a lot of the offspring are half sibs. There's going to be variation there in both relatedness, but also in like, the genes they have. There be variation there. Uh, I'm not sure. I know in ants in, ants in general, they, the way they recognize kin is by something called colony odor. Right? So if you smell like the nest, it must be one of us. Um, which is why things like those butterflies that eat ant larvae can get in. Um, <coughs> so not only does they, they can tell those are not sure about other insects though. Yeah. Other questions? That's kind of crazy. So there are some, there are some um, ants that the term is slave maker ants. So people have criticized that for being an inappropriate term. What they'll do is they, they, they don't have any workers that take care of anything. The workers in that species just are adapted to finding other colonies, going off and raiding and taking back pupae. Okay? And so then you're a pupa, you come out in your cocoon, and here, okay, you have my nest, new nest mates, and so these raided pupae, when they become adults, will take care of the ants that have abducted them. Um, that's crazy. So they're from army ants. The army ants are just killing things and eating them. These are actually sort of kidnapping ants. Good variation. Okay. <coughs>
So, big, big loss. Remember, this is somebody else's, right? And so, we also have the, you know, these big losses have, you know, three moderately low positives. And these big losses, they're long and positive. Why is that be for? They cheat, right. How does, how does one cheat? Right. So rather than going inside, and calling all of you, so I think that would be dropping your head. So like the body would be dropping your head, they went inside. And so, <coughs> you go by your ends, and then they go inside, and they go by inside. These blocks, when they go inside, they tend to lose their wings and things like that. But these, the positive inference too. How does this cause stick evolution? What's what the select pressure like for the fig? We do better if there were no cheaters. Right. Mm -hmm. A harder exterior or a thicker exterior. And so you must have this arm race between little positive length and fig thickness. Okay. Well, so some of them are, so some species are mutual risks. Right, so with this, when um, the flies out, the flies in the middle of the if the fig, if the fig isn't pollinated, then the seeds would develop the blossom and then survive on them. Right. So it's totally mutual. This one, um, <coughs> um, it would be pollination. So it relies on this one being fertilized and then the seeds. It's actually a parasite on both the fig and also mutual. Um, what? Yep. How so? Why? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. So and one thing is that even the mutualists are cost to the fish. I will carry your pollen over, I will eat from some of the babies. Some your seeds. Okay, so if you get a positive it be short of having seeds set regardless of that, and you can go to the mutualists. I need to not cross it. Okay, what's interesting also that shows that, you know, ignoring the parasitizing species, even the mutualists, you see ways where you know, the, even that people hurt the fish. Um, and, th and these groups, I believe so, yeah. They might have some self in them, not sure. In terms of um, number of species, I think so. In terms of number of individuals, I think so as well. I'm not sure. Yeah. And things have a second abortion mechanism where if you have too many parasites, too many wasps within them, they'll just stop producing the pigs. And so it's like, in the system. And so if there are a lot of parasites, then you start dropping more and more things. So the broader point for today is just this interaction between insects and other things. There's a lot of there's a lot of mutualisms and interactions. And here we even see this indirect interaction where in the presence of more bees hurts these is a proportion of one thing insects are famous for is um, mimicry. Okay. And there's two kinds, right? all nasty. Um, and 
Why make this evolve? So I'm, I'm brightly colored, I'm dassy tasting, you, you bite me and it's, I'm yucky. Okay, great. Why does Melissa say that too though? Right, exactly. So the same way that the tasty ones made better than the nasty ones, the nasty ones also get better than the other nasty ones. If it wants to go better than one nasty one anywhere, it might let them choose one at all. I don't, don't know about that paper, but it makes sense. <coughs> right, so if you're a friendly plug and you're a friendly plug one, right, and then your range exceeds their range, so in the periphery you have all these ones that, look, they're friendly colored and then delicious. Right, <laughs> um, of course, you know, things like some monarchs and viceroys. You know, it's always, always a fuzzy area in biology. These are really sensitive to different mechanisms. Right. We don't know anything really about science. Um, okay, so mimicry is very important in insects. Okay. Insects also do very weird things about um, finding a mate, so sexual selection. Okay, so still sexual selection, yeah, right. And so, right, here we see the famous case, right, of naked and naked. It doesn't happen as often as you think it does in movies, um, but it does happen. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see some different spiders that do. Sex. Do the same thing with the male will maybe the female throw himself into her jaws. If she doesn't like eat him, he'll try it again. <laughs> and <coughs> so why might a male do that? Yeah. Right. Yep, so he's sort of giving his eggs some food. Right? Some extra extra nutrition. You're bad people. Um, why else? They were laughing at the people falling down. Yeah. Um, why else might it be ambiguous? Even that, so even it has no nutritional benefit for females, for the, for the offspring, obviously the ambiguous. Sacrifice yourself to your mate. So, in some instances, it would take a while to actually finish fertilization. And so, basically, you're keeping them busy while finishing fertilizing. It's almost like that. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> the fancy little bugs walking around butt to butt on the ground, but you just made it. Um, we also see things like you know, animal competition. So not only do we have elephant seals and rams, we also see what we're doing in the cave. Right. <coughs> um, what's this? An engine? These are columbula. Okay. So these are insects that have wings, that have no wings, and have never had wings. It's not a loss of wings, it's just a group that never evolved wings. So they're sisters to those that have wings. Okay? And their reproduction, rather than, um, you know, male, when you have a female to mate, the male will leave half of the sperm on the ground and walk off. And their female will come by and say, oh, that's great. And use it. Um, <coughs> that's involved in some formula where the female here 
How would affect sort of sexual selection, right? Because then you don't actually see the male, in fact, the male director, this is male artifact. There's been sexual selection for <coughs> making him feel like he's a good male, so some sort of hostile signal. I don't know what that would be. I think about how that could evolve. Okay. And here is fireflies. Yeah. And they're all flashing at once. And this is a weird behavior that we used to think was only in Southeast Asia. And about seven years ago or so, we actually found it in Tennessee. So Tennessee is an area where the fireflies will all start flashing and synchronizing. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and so there they use sexual signaling by, you know, this flashing. And so you can tell which species is which by the flash signals. But there's some females that can actually mimic females of other species. And then males will come down and say, ooh, look, and then get you. Right, so these signals, you can learn to co-opt the signals. Okay. Um, <coughs> just a couple of minutes, one minute left. You know, this weird insect eating, right? Um, here's a dragonfly again. <laughs> it has jet propulsion. And then it can shoot out its mass and get itself. And here we see a ball, right? So, in, so this is an oak gall, so I can see balls. And what happened is the insect has laid an egg, and the plants form tissue around it. The insect then eats, and then it eats all the other. Okay. Here are dung beetles, of course. These are also from dung. You can actually have parental care. You can actually feed the little babies. No, no, no. actually parental care of the insect. And finally, we also have really cool evolution of the types of insects. Okay, so, ants, and we deal with the ants, and here's um, these are ants squirting acid. And actually, the way you collect ants is by sucking up their straw and filter. <laughs> and so that beetle's squirting out liquid that's actually boiling hot. There's an exothermic chemical reaction that generates a lot of heat. And that, you know, that's the standard, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's all these chemical defenses and physical defenses that they use. <laughs> All right, so this is the majority of life, is this sort of stuff. So it's really cool to study these insects. Right? And look at, think of how it relates to macroevolutionary stories. <laughs> it's like my eye. <laughs> <laughs> Runs away unscathed. <laughs> Oh, that's, there's, a, there's a, a lizard that mimics that beetle. She walks the same way, so it appears like that beetle. Let's see in a second. Let's see, so watch it. See how it walks like that. <laughs> 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 Let's see how it walks. <laughs> 